Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for, for coming here. It's a great day. Uh, and and uh, the purpose of our meeting here is uh, to hear the report uh, from CSIS, uh, excellent report uh, on, on U.S.-Indonesia partnership for 2020. Uh, this is a report that, that tries to evaluate what has been done in the course of the partnership between our countries and uh, recommendations to move forward. So I'm so glad that we have a lot of stakeholders here from the government, from the legislature, from the NGO communities and other partners. Uh, and let's uh, have a great discussions today. And uh, with that, I would like to invite uh, Ernie Bauer from CSIS to open up the meeting. Thank you. Well, Dino, thank you. And I'd like to thank you and your staff for the, the warm hospitality. Uh, Indonesian hospitality is, is always warm uh, and usually a little bit spicy if you have some, uh, some the right kind of uh, gado gado. Um, but it's great to be here uh, at the embassy. We, uh, we really appreciate it because CSIS found itself in a bit of a, in a, bit, in a, bit of a spot. We actually have moved uh, from our, our old building at 1800 K Street to a new building that uh, our, our president and CEO, John Hamry, uh, built uh, with the support of, of all of you, the supporters of, of CSIS, and uh, we're, we actually moved over to that new building, and it's beautiful, but it's not ready for prime time yet. So uh, when it is ready, uh, we would hope to be able to host Dino and the embassy uh, and many Indonesian events uh, in that facility. We've got a real treat here today. And, uh, and, and that is because we're, we get to talk about Indonesia for, for uh, a good hour and a half. And I think we all know how important Indonesia is to, uh, to the United States, to ASEAN, uh, as, a, as an anchor uh, of ASEAN, which it, in itself is a fulcrum uh, for uh, a regional uh, integration and, and a geopolitical strategy uh, for the long term. So, CSIS decided to do a study. We have, as you know, uh, the Southeast Asia Chair, uh, the Sumitra Chair for Southeast Asian Studies at CSIS, each year does um, three to four major research projects, and, and this is our second uh, for, for 2013. Uh, it's called the U.S.-Indonesia Partnership for 2020. Uh, I want to thank in particular uh, Ted Osius, who was visiting us uh, for a year at CSI, more than visiting, you were you were with us. He was part of the family. Uh, we we got him on loan from the State Department for a year, and Ted really mixed things up. In fact, he's been involved as a key author of both of our initial uh, research projects this year: the um, India ASEAN project and the Indonesia 2020 uh, project. So, Ted, thank you very much. I'd like to also uh, recognize um, uh, Murray Hebert. Uh, Greg Poling and the other members of our team who have been uh, leaders in, in pulling this uh, report together. We will, this is the launch of the report. It will actually be on CSIS's website uh, as of, is it up now? It's, it's already there. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. We, we pre-launched it so you could do your homework and hit us, hit the panelists with really hard questions if you would. Um, what I'd like to do is, is get out of your way um, and, and introduce you to uh, a, a video. Uh, we decided to build a multimedia presentation that would pull in some of the key messages about what Indonesia is and why it's important. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to invite um, Ted Osius to, to lead us through the um, findings of the report. And then we'll have an excellent panel uh, who will provide some commentary. And then I'll open, uh, open up the floor to all of you. Uh, so that you can uh, ask the, the uh, pertinent questions of the day. Again, Dino, thank you. And Greg, could we see the video, please? Thank you. Indonesia is home to 250 million people, making it the world's third largest democracy and the largest Muslim-majority country. Currently the world's 16th biggest economy with a 2012 GDP of more than $1 trillion, it's predicted to move up to 7th by 2030, driven by strong domestic demand and a young population. The U.S. State Department considers it a linchpin of regional security because of its geostrategic location in the center of maritime Asia. 
The two governments launched a comprehensive partnership in 2010, forging close ties on security and defense. Joint military exercises happen regularly as both sides work to modernize Indonesia's forces. Bilateral defense trade is up as the country increases military spending. Democracy building is also a key aspect of the partnership. Fifteen years after the end of President Suharto's authoritarian rule in 1998, Indonesia has become the most stable and vibrant democracy in Southeast Asia. All eyes are on the 2014 election. President Yudhoyono is term limited and will be leaving office. Twelve parties will compete for seats in the legislature, which will determine the presidential candidates. The election may spotlight Indonesia's tendency toward economic nationalism and protectionism, which could present a challenge to efforts to improve overall trade ties. Indonesia is America's 34th largest export market, eighth largest for its agricultural products. However, the figure should be much higher, given Indonesia's rapidly growing middle class. Most U.S. investments are in energy and mining. Poor infrastructure and governance issues hamper investment opportunities in manufacturing and services. Indonesia's rise will shift the power dynamics in Asia. It has stepped forward as a leader in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN. Like the United States, Indonesia views a strong ASEAN as a key to a peaceful, prosperous Asia-Pacific in the 21st century. As the country's clout increases, it will become an important center of economic and strategic power, meaning the bilateral relationship with the U.S. will be more vital to both nations. It's one neither side can afford to neglect. Well, I don't know about you. That was my first time seeing the video. I really enjoyed it. And Ambassador Jalal uh, said, why not put it on YouTube? I think that's a great idea. I think we should, we should get it up and on YouTube as soon as we can. Uh, a few words of thanks. I wanted to thank Ernie for inviting me to CSIS for a year and for his leadership of a really great Southeast Asia team. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Jalal, for hosting us today. And thank you especially for your energetic and deep commitment to this partnership. Uh, thank you to my former boss, Ambassador Scott Marcial, who as ambassador to Indonesia built and strengthened this partnership. Thank you also to Everett Eisenstadt for joining us today. He's one of this city's top trade experts. And I wanted to uh, give a special thanks to two great collaborators uh, on this report. Uh, Murray Hebert, who not only wrote much of the report, but was the driving force behind the, the conference that we held last May on Indonesia, uh, and Greg Poling, uh, who's really the report's primary author and who also uh, organized our visit to Jakarta last February. Uh, I have to offer the usual caveat. I'm speaking in my personal capacity, not on behalf of the State Department, and not on behalf of my current employer, uh, the National War College. As you heard in the video, it's a broad relationship. And we tried to organize the report uh, to reflect what are the three pillars of the comprehensive partnership. Political security cooperation, economic and trade relations, and people-to-people -people collaboration. And you'll see there's no sort of one silver bullet. There's no one thing that will thrust the relationship forward. It's going to be a combination of actions in all three of those areas. Many, when we went to uh, Jakarta last February, many people took time to meet with us, and many more uh, participated in our conference last May. Your thoughts, their thoughts, fed directly into this report, though we don't hold you responsible for the report's findings. But as the, the participants in the conference did, what we tried to do in this report was to make it forward-looking. So what I'll do is focus on a few key recommendations. If you could go to the first set. Now, there are 50 recommendations. If I marched through all of those, it would be like the Bataan Death March. So I promise <laughs> I'll just focus on a, on a few sort of highlight recommendations. Now, these are the first four summarize, I'm summarizing here, the first four of the political security recommendations. I think it's not surprising that we re recommend sustained high-level attention to the partnership. And we also stress in the report that the more that governments can involve civil society, 
private sector, <coughs> academia, non-government organizations in developing the partnership, the greater will be its energy. The greater will be the commitment to the relationship and the greater will be the resources that are available for the relationship. And that's not to mention that the best ideas don't always come out of the government. Uh, and implementing great ideas shouldn't always be up to the government. We, uh, we highlight the importance of strengthening the ties between our two legislatures, tremendously important. Uh, Indonesia's parliament is no longer a rubber stamp, as anyone in the, in the <laughs> in administration will testify. They'll go after uh, members of the administration. But I'd like to dwell, and maybe we'll go to the next slide. I'd like to dwell for a minute on the, uh, one, of the recommend, one specific recommendation on what we like to call triangular collaboration with Indonesia on regional challenges. This is the fourth of, of our political security recommendations. Now, Indonesia has long treasured, uh, has a, a very long tradition which it treasures of a free and active diplomacy. But in the past few years, as the video points out, uh, Indonesia has also assumed a much greater international leadership role that's consistent with its economic growth and consistent with its rising self-confidence. I, I like to think of it as Indonesia's resumed its, its pre-1998 role as the diplomatic heavyweight within ASEAN. It helped broker a Thai-Cambodia border dispute. It's pro been providing leadership on South China Sea issues. Uh, through Indonesia's Bali Democracy Forum, Indonesia promotes democratic values. And it determined that contributing to Afghanistan's transition by training Afghan police was in Indonesia's interest. Indonesia has also been actively sharing its experiences of democratic transformation with the countries of the Arab Spring. Now, during our CSIS conference in May, last, uh, last, just last May, uh, Foreign Minister Marty Natalagawa gave the keynote speech, and in it he boldly proposed a treaty of amity and cooperation, not just for ASEAN, but for all of the nations of the Indo-Pacific. And I think this is, exemplifies uh, a, a new boldness, a new energy in Indonesian diplomacy. In Myanmar, uh, former Indonesian Vice President Yusuf Kala engaged very, very constructively on the Rohingya issue. And uh, Foreign Minister Natalagawa visited, visited Rakhine State in order to help promote national reconciliation in Myanmar. It, if you look at the history of those two nations, Indonesia is in a unique pos position to help Myanmar during its shift towards democracy. The Burmese military already looks to Indonesia as a model for how it might ease out of politics and still remain relevant. I think we need to look at challenges such as Myanmar, the South China Sea, Afghanistan, and the Middle East as opportunities for the United States and Indonesia to come together. When we collaborate, we can produce much more than either nation can produce alone. It's, for an American policymaker, it's, it's very clear. In Indonesia is prominent among the mem members of the Non-Aligned Movement. It's prominent in the Organization for Islamic Cooperation. And those, among other things, make it an ideal partner for the United States in, countries, in dealing with countries and issues around the globe. Now, this triangular collaboration is made possible because our interests are converging and because there, we have a lot of values in common, two large, diverse, pluralistic democracies uh, share uh, uh, an outlook in many ways. Our goal is not full agreement. Uh, heaven knows it's not alliance. But it is closer, closer collaboration over time on international issues through consultation, through full and open discussions, and eventually through burden sharing. We didn't create this partnership just so that we could look at one another and focus on one another but so our two great nations could make a difference in the world. Let's go to the next set of slides. In the econ and trade area, uh, I already mentioned the importance of energizing government to government dialogues by including outsiders or you know, by, uh, you can provide much more energy if you're not just dealing with governments 
but you're also dealing with the energy of the private sector uh, and, and uh, non-government actors. But I want to stress here the importance of our third recommendation, that Indonesia maintain an open trade and investment environment. As a member of the G20, Indonesia made significant commitments in 2010 in Toronto, in 2011 in Cannes, to avoid protectionism, to reinforce the multilateral trading system, and to roll back any new protectionist measures. If Indonesia is to be a credible leader on global economic issues, it can't afford to indulge in the kind of economic nationalism that's documented in Chapter 2 of this report. Now, we also notice, uh, uh, note, on the other hand, the importance of U.S. businesses taking a long-term view of the opportunities in Indonesia. And let's go to the next slide. For if, uh, we did a special event at CSAS, particularly on this. It was focused on what can U.S. businesses do so that they're more, uh, they're more effective, more profitable, uh, have better success in Indonesia. If, if U.S. businesses are going to succeed, they should look at the example of other U.S. businesses that have succeeded. The, the businesses have done very well in Indonesia are those who have invested, have done the foundational work of developing relationships, developing partnerships, uh, and investing in, in their communities in Indonesia. The, comp the companies that have followed that formula are reaping significant <laughs> rewards for their efforts. They're doing very well. Uh, next slide, please. In our, our chapter on people-to-people -people collaboration, you won't be surprised that we focus first on education. Uh, last April, CSIS invited Pakputra Semperna to Washington so that we could examine in depth his innovative ideas on how you could increase educational collaboration between our two countries. And I commend to you uh, Putra Semperna's white paper, which is posted on the CSIS website. It focuses uh, on what we can do to uh, strengthen educational ties. And I think, is David Merrill here today? Well, da uh, Dave, the UCINDO is another institution that's really devoted uh, itself to uh, educational collaboration, put great effort into that. Uh, and Ambassador Merrill uh, helped create the Joint U.S.-Indonesia Council on Higher Education, an important element in that collaboration. In this part of the report, we also highlighted the importance of collaborating on health, on clean water, on urban planning, deforestation, climate change, science and technology. But I, I'm not going to go through every one of these recommendations, I promised you. So let me just go to two in this area. Uh, one, and uh, let's go to the next slide, fisheries. Uh, we, recommended, we recommend establishing a joint U.S.-Indonesia Center for Sustainable Ocean Fisheries, a research institute in which scientists from both of our countries could explore and study the waters that house the world's highest ocean biodiversity. Ambassador Marcial devoted a lot of time to uh, food security during his time as ambassador. Uh, and he and I think all of us here can acknowledge that food security isn't just about rice and grains. For the people of Southeast Asia, it's also about fish. Catch certificates should reflect where fish are caught instead of where they are processed. And that's something the U.S. Uh, could make a major contribution to. The next slide, please. And this will be the last recommendation I'll, I'll mention. Um, but outreach to youth. We recommend increasing the number of private sector partnerships that exist with Ad America. It's the U.S. Embassy's high-tech outreach center in Jakarta. And uh, more partnerships with the private sector would enable Ad America to enhance its capability to reach Indonesian youth and to show off the best of U.S. technologies. During the three years since, it's o since it opened its doors, Ad America has attracted 360,000 people. 85% of them are young Indonesians between the ages of 15 and 30, our target demographic. But it, this is, as we all know, we're looking at October 1st, this is a, an era of limited government resources. And a facility like Ad America cannot fulfill its potential without support and partnerships uh, from the outside. 
Uh, so my final note of thanks is to you, our, our guests today, and following comments from the panel, we hope that you will pose questions to, to me or to Murray or Greg about, uh, about this report or offer your thoughts on the ideas that are behind Partnership 2020. And let me go to the last slide. This is where you can find it. If you didn't, if you didn't happen to click on it yet when you got the invitation to this event, uh, you can download the report. Um, and I urge you to, if you would, look at the other 40-some recommendations, the one that, that I didn't march you through. Thanks very much. Thanks for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ted, and um, do I have to turn this on? Uh, thank you very much, Ted. I appreciate the, uh, the outstanding summary and the hard work that uh, you put into uh, to making that document such a dynamic uh, set of recommendations, and ones that we hope uh, the White House will be, uh, uh, and Merdaka Square would be looking at as they prepare for uh, President Obama's visit to uh, Indonesia uh, in October. I think there's some, some good ideas uh, there that, that both governments uh, and, as you mentioned, private sector and, and civil society organizations could consider. I've got a real, uh, a, it's a real treat for me to uh, introduce this panel. Um, two of the men who uh, were absolute champions of uh, bringing the U.S.-Indonesia relationship to where it stands today, and two very good friends. Um, do you know, Dino Dijal is the ambassador, Indonesian ambassador to the United States. Um, as, as some of you know, uh, he will be headed back to his country uh, in the next couple months. Um, he has high aspirations for, uh, for, his, uh, for his leadership role, as do I, quite frankly. I'd love to see a, a man with his energy um, and vision. Uh, leading his country as, as he has as ambassador, uh, but in, in new ways. So good luck to you, Dino, and, and again, thanks for having us here. Scott Marcel, uh, is, as far as I know, is not running in 2016, um, <laughs> but he is back. He's, he's come back to his country uh, with actually uh, also high aspirations. And when we, uh, when we look at uh, leaders in the United States who really understand Southeast Asia, from the roots up, um, I, I think of Scott as a, a first among equals in that group. He's um, uh, particularly coming back from Jakarta, uh, particularly coming back from his leadership role at the U.S. Embassy there in, in what were very critical years for Indonesia's, um, if, if you will, sort of uh, coming out and the building of confidence there. And I think, Scott, we, uh, we're really honored to have you here today. He's now the um, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for this region and the, uh, and the State Department's Office, or Bureau of East Asian, uh, um, East Asian Pacific Affairs. And finally, uh, one of the best trade minds, as, as uh, Ted mentioned earlier, uh, in, in Washington, uh, a, a man who's worked on um, thinking about how the United States uh, relates to the rest of the world when it comes to trade, uh, Everett Eisenstadt, he's the Chief International Trade Council in the U.S. Senate Finance Committee. I will mention um, that Everett's comments, because he's in the Senate, uh, have to be off the record. So for the, those of you that are in the audience and, and taking notes, particularly you members of the media or people who write blogs, Everett, um, we, we have to ask you to respect his requirement uh, to be off the record. And when we produce the video of today's event, we will I don't know, somehow North Korea like cut him out of everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, having said that, uh, let me hand it over to, uh, we'll, we'll tee off uh, right down the table and uh, I'll, I'll hand it to my friend uh, Dino uh, Dijal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ernie. And um, first, let me thank CSIS for producing this excellent report. Uh, Ted, uh, Murray, uh, Ernie. I've read uh, the report and I've read the recommendations and I can guarantee you that 
uh, at least for my delegation uh, attending the JCM uh, from now on and continuously, uh, the US-Indonesia report produced by the CSIS will be uh, a key reference for us uh, in, in the how to uh, design the way forward for our relations. So thank you very much for this uh, enormous intellectual and policy contributions. So uh, actually, I want to invite everybody to give them a big hand for this. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Ernie, uh, thank you um, for, for your comments. Uh, but what will I do after United States, uh, my stint in the United States? But uh, to be honest, I'm a bit humbled by it because technically I'll be unemployed. Right? <laughs> so you'll, you'll see me a lot in the media in the next uh, six, seven months because I'll be running for the presidency of uh, Indonesia. But uh, technically, I'll still be unemployed. So I'll be glorified unemployed person glorified in Indonesia. <laughs> When I came to the United States as ambassador three years ago, my aim is basically to let Americans know two things. One is when you think of Asia, uh, don't think of just China, Japan, or India. Think about Indonesia as the largest country in Southeast Asia and as what someone would say the next rising Asian giant. And the second thing that I want Americans to know is the strategic importance of Indonesia with things which have been highlighted in the video and in Ted's uh, presentation. And I think I can sufficiently say that after three years, many Americans have begun to understand and appreciate that. And this is reflected in the bilateral relations between Indonesia and uh, the United States. The state of relations today is, I would say, very, very good. Uh, this. There is public misperception in Indonesia about uh, America being heavy-handed. You know, but uh, to be honest, uh, in my dealings with the United States, my dealings with Lynn Pasco, uh, with uh, Cameron Hume, with uh, Scott Marshall and others, uh, you know, we, we have a good debate, we have good back and forth, uh, but I've never felt that the United States uh, is, is heavy-handed. At the end of the day, uh, there's always room to agree to disagree, right? And this is one thing that I appreciate most uh, in my dealing with uh, American uh, diplomats. Uh, comfort level is high now. Uh, strategic trust is higher uh, than before. We have uh, structured relationships, which we did not have for decades. Structured relationship means at least every year there's a joint commission ministerial with six established working groups dealing with different sectors. Um, and uh, the relationship is not no longer seen as ad hoc yeah? uh, or single issue interests. Uh, relationship now is comprehensive, which is why we call it comprehensive partnership uh, and structured. And there's understanding of the strategic importance uh, on both sides of the equation. So the state of relations is good. Relations before used to be thin, yeah, uh, but now it's getting deeper. Yeah, it's getting deeper, uh, although not as deep as we want to be. Uh, there are two key figures in U.S. In, in Indonesia's perception of the United States, there's always two key figures. One is who is the president? Yeah, who is the president of the United States? Yeah, because he's the one always in the media uh, in Indonesia. And the second is the ambassador, right? Uh, the ambassador in Indonesia is a rock star. You know, uh, Scott Marshall is a rock star, Lynn Pasco there, a rock star. He's always on the front page in a way that I'm never in the front page in Washington Post, <laughs> right? Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a great asset, right? So if you want to see how the barometer turns up, you know, look at who the president is, how he or she is being perceived in, in Indonesia, and who is the ambassador and how effective. So it's, it's very important to have the right combination of, of, of the two. Now, relations are very good now. But uh, now the question, we're coming closer to the question of whether or not this relationship will be, uh, will maintain its vigor and vitality after SBY is gone next year. Yeah. My president, SBY, has been the most active president in promoting U.S.-Indonesia relations. He's the one who first came up with the comprehensive partnership. Yeah. He's the one who just put all his political and diplomatic capital into this relationship. He'll be gone in 2014. And President Obama will be gone uh, in 2016, mm -hmm. right? So our challenge is this relationship that was helped by the personal connections between the two and the fact that the two leaders have spent time in Indonesia as well as in America. 
uh, can it survive the post SBY and post Obama uh, era uh, in the next two, uh, three years? And our job is to make sure that it does uh, survive. And I think it's wise, while we still have time until 2014, for both sides to take it as far as possible, as fast as possible, uh, so that by the time that we get to the post-Obama, post-SBY era, this relationship is very, very solid uh, and, and uh, irreversible. But in Indonesia, the question is being asked, uh, at least for now, now that relations are very good and very strong, um, about uh, sustainability and speed. Yeah, uh, My government is asking, my politicians is asking, sustainability is the pivot after, in the second term of Obama administration, is the pivot to Asia sustainable? Uh, with all this attention on the Middle East, you know, some one politician even said, is there going to be time for re-rebalancing to, <laughs> to Asia? Not rebalancing, but re-rebalancing to, to Asia. I thought that was a very interesting comment that he made, right? Uh, and speed, you know, uh, speed means, yeah, we're going fast, yeah, but can we maintain that speed or even go even faster, right? So sustainability and speed is going to be uh, qu uh, quite uh, important uh, to watch. Uh, the next thing that we need to address in, the, in maintaining the relations uh, uh, beyond post-SBY, post-Obama era, is uh, strategic trust. Strategic trust is much better now than, say, 10 years ago, mm. yeah, let alone 20 years ago. Uh, but there's still some challenge. In America, my challenge is really to convince the remaining uh, members of Congress who still sometimes see Indonesia from the old eyes. Yeah? Uh, some NGOs who still see Indonesia from the old days. Right? Maybe they need to go to Indonesia and see how Indonesia has really, really changed to be one of the most transforming societies in Asia, if not, if not the world. But from the American side, uh, I think there's work to be done in uh, convincing the TNI, our military, yeah, uh, as you know, uh, there's embargo for so many years uh, between our militaries, uh, and there there are still segments within the military that where the discomfort is still there. Yeah, uh, there are some there, there are segments in the military which are very open and up to speed with uh, U.S. Indonesia relations and mil mil relations, especially those who went to NDU, yeah, who were educated here and got into the IMED programs, and so they understand that. But those who miss that 10 years, you know, the discomfort is still there. I'm speaking about this very, very honestly, and we need to earn uh, that uh, strategic trust from that segment of the population. The third challenge is I think our relations is still uh, below our potentials. You know, I'm working very hard here. Scott is working even harder in, in Jakarta, uh, but relations is still under the potential. Uh, two quick examples. Our trade with China is over 52 billion. Our trade with the United States is half that, 26 billion. And 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you would see that when people in Indonesia talk about trade, in uh, world trade, they only think about three countries, US, Japan, and Europe, right? But now it's China, way ahead of the United States. So again, uh, America is a bigger economy than China, and I think uh, we are still below our potential. Even the students, yeah, uh, now the students are, I don't know what is the number, I think around 7,500, whereas uh, a few years ago it was 15,000, and now it's back up, yeah, but we still need to double it, and we still need to reach uh, that level. But catching up with the potentials is going to be our uh, uh, big uh, challenge. The fourth challenge, I would say, is implementing programs. You know, I'm very, very good in drawing things up on paper, you know, coming up with great ideas, you know, and Scott also, everybody, you know, but we realize, hey, we write this down and let's implement it. You know, it's not as difficult as on paper, you know. I admit in my bureaucracy as well, you get great ideas, but not everyone in the bureaucracy is up to speed, right? Not everyone has adapted to this new, vibrant, dynamic U.S.-Indonesia relations, and sometimes easy issues, issues that I said to Scott, hey, we get this done in one month. No, it takes a year or two, and you know what I'm talking about, right? So again, uh, getting the bureaucracy up to speed is gonna be very important in terms of how we uh, promote our bilateral relations. Uh, and I think this goes back to my earlier comment that our relations is still thin and is getting deeper, right? But not deep enough. Right? And that is reflected in the fact that sometimes these programs face bureaucratic resistance. Right? Uh, 
uh, is also important uh, personal relations, right? Relations between our leaders, between President Obama and President SBY is critical that they sit one another, they talk face to face, heart to heart, you know, uh, to maintain that is very important. But most important, in my experience, I'm sure Scott will agree, the relationship between the, my foreign minister and Secretary of State. Uh, I think in the last four years when uh, Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton uh, uh, was at State Department, she had a very good personal relations with my foreign minister. And uh, it's a relationship based on trust, and they can call anytime. And one thing that my foreign minister likes about uh, Secretary Hillary, she listened a lot. She listened a lot more than she talked in any of their meetings. Right, and she really wants to know what's what's you know what's the bottom line and what is at the back of their minds, right? And and this is uh, uh, one thing that we need to continue uh, between President Kerry and my foreign minister. I'm glad they're going to meet in New York uh, in in Friday, right? And and I really hope that they're going to be able to establish a personal friendship. Last point, uh, I asked. Ernie earlier, what is the purpose of our meeting here? Is it just to say I love you or to be honest about relationship and to be enlightened about relationship? And Ernie being the, you know, the think tank person say, hey, go for the second one, go for the second one. <laughs> so I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if this is going to be uh, public or not, but you know, I, I'll let you decide. There is one structural uh, weakness and challenge in our relationship, right? Now, what that is, and this is something that I don't think Scott and Lynn could do anything about, but it's a structural issue that you need to know about from our viewpoint. What is that? There's an impression in Indonesia that U.S. foreign policy is judgmental. Now, what do I mean by it? There was a time just several months ago when in the course of just two, three months, I get four or five reports issued by the U.S. government about Indonesia, you know, about, uh, you know, different issues, yeah? I don't need to, n to name them, but, uh, you know, look, we appreciate this is congressionally mandated, but on the other hand, it's not easy for us, you know? Uh, the analogy is like this. We were friends before, and then now we become best friends, you know, with the strategic partnership, right? Since 2010, that elevated our relationship, not just as friend, but as comprehensive partner. But then, even though we're best friends every week, I say something about you, you know, hey, you know good, you know this, you don't, you don't not doing well in this, and you, you know, which is fine sometimes, but if it goes too often, uh, then, you know, it, it reduces the, the comfort level, especially if it's being made public and worldwide, especially if the opposition reads it and use it against you especially if the public reads it and use it to criticize uh, the government. If it's just a close report, confidential report that we get to see, that is fine. But I need to be honest about this. This is a bit hard to take, you know, and this is a structural challenge in our relationship because you are congressionally mandated to say this, to, to issue these reports. And it may be easy on you, but it's not easy on us. Again, this needs to be said because this is the purpose of our partnership, being honest with one another, and with that, uh, I'll shut up. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Dina. Scott? Uh, thanks very much, Ernie. Is this on? Yeah, I think so. Um, thanks, Ernie. Um, uh, thanks, Dino, first for, for hosting this uh, at your wonderful embassy, uh, and for your, your always you know, very thoughtful remarks. Um, Thanks to Ernie and, and Ted and Murray and Greg and everybody for uh, having this event, but more importantly for, for the effort to do this report. Uh, and Ernie, I have to congratulate you. You know, I tried to get Ted to, for two years to get a report done. <laughs> he always said he was too busy. So, uh, Just let him write what he wants to. That's the thing. <laughs> I'm joking. Ted did a great job in, in Jakarta. Um, uh, and and ever, I'm glad you're here so you can answer the question about the congressionally mandated <laughs> reports. That, you know, uh, uh, and it's also good that um, former Ambassador Lynn Pasco, um, one of my predecessors in Jakarta, uh, is here. Um, I guess, you know, I, first I have to start as I usually do with these things with Dino. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with, with your comments. I mean, I think one of the reasons that the relationship is close is because we, we see eye to eye, including on what the challenges are. 
uh, in the relationship. Um, I, one thing I, I am a little bit concerned about is Dino's comment that Lynn and I were not heavy handed. Um, <laughs> I'm not afraid if that gets known here, I'll be in a lot of trouble. Um, but uh, I think, seriously, I think this comprehensive partnership is really a great framework and a great vehicle for building the relationship. Um, it was a fine relationship, but uh, frankly, underperforming. Uh, we weren't doing as much as we could for a whole host of reasons. It's not necessarily you know, a pointing fingers exercise. Uh, for a variety of reasons, we weren't doing as much together as countries as we, we probably could have or, or should have. And I think the comprehensive framework provides uh, a great vehicle for changing that. Um, I think, I agree with Dino, the goal for me in my, my mind of the comprehensive partnership was building a strong and, uh, relationship that was durable, that could be sustained and did not depend on who is sitting in the Astana and who is sitting in the White House. I mean, it's always nice to have that top cover and that, that high level support, but it, these relationships to, to be sustainable can't depend on uh, individuals in the White House nearly so much. Um, I think the, the good news is we've made a lot of progress under the comprehensive partnership. I think the governments are engaging together, working together, consulting, cooperating, uh, far more broadly and deeply than even three or four years ago. Uh, in addition to the traditional things like the diplomacy, of course, uh, the military to military relationship has, has grown quite dramatically, but also working together in health, science and technology, entrepreneurship, the environment, uh, you name it. There's, there's a whole host of areas where we're now working together uh, very actively. Um, trade, as, as you and others have mentioned, and uh, I'm sure Everett will touch on, has been kind of an underperforming part of the relationship and one that, that's not easily addressed, but one that we have to keep working at uh, with the support and the, and the cooperation of both business communities. I think there's a, there's a lot more that we could and should be doing um, in that area. Uh, one positive note is, is uh, Ted referred to the triangular cooperation, the idea that because we have shared values and shared interests in many places, the United States and Indonesia ought to be able to, to collaborate uh, around the world uh, and in third countries uh, in a positive way. And we're already seeing that beginning to happen. Just a few weeks ago, uh, Indonesia had another one of its, its very useful seminars on promoting uh, stronger democratic institutions in the Arab world and USAID was able to contribute some funding to that, which allowed it to be a little bit bigger and, and, and I th hopefully better event than it otherwise would have been. And in a way, it's a good partnership. I mean, it was very much an Indonesian-driven thing with an Indonesian face on it, but we supported it because we also shared, uh, had a shared interest. And I think there's more of that coming our way. Um, I'd like to to spend uh, a few minutes on what I think is, is the biggest challenge and opportunity for us, and, and Dino and others have touched on it, um, which is, you know, in two democracies, this relationship, uh, the depth and strength of this relationship does depend heavily on public support. Mm -hmm. and, and frankly, that's where we need to do a lot more work. And I would say the biggest challenge in the United States is not anti-Indonesian sentiment, uh, but rather, uh, you know, I was going to say blissful ignorance. I'm not sure it's quite so blissful, but ignorance, lack of knowledge of Indonesia. Uh, it's changing, as you said. It's, 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 you know, we're seeing more and more uh, awareness out there, and programs like this are so important. It's astonishing to me that I can go talk to fairly sophisticated, what I would consider global people, and they're shocked to find out that Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world. They have no idea, which I find rather amazing. So um, we, we have a lot of work to do in, in, in informing uh, the American people, uh, certainly the business community, but also the academic community, et cetera, as well as our friends in Capitol Hill about the importance of Indonesia and all that's happening there. Um, on the Indonesian side, I would say the, the people certainly have much more information about the United States. I'm not sure how accurate it is, um, but we have a huge challenge. There's, there's a deep, deep skepticism about the United States in Indonesia. Everybody, Lynn 
I, I think you had largely resolved it when you were there, but it's come back a little bit. Um, and you know, it's, it's based on a lot of history. Uh, it's based on you know, the colonial period, the, the Sukarno period, and the Cold War, and then more recently it's, it's based on concerns about how the U.S. views Islam. And so we have a lot of work. I think we have a very good story to tell, but it's going to take a huge effort over, over many years to, uh, to try to reduce the level of skepticism and even suspicion that a lot of people still have in the United States, about the United States and Indonesia. I do think we've made progress, um, but it's one of those things that we just can't afford to let up on. And so that's why I'm a huge believer in the importance of public diplomacy and outreach programs, uh, bringing people together, whether it's students or uh, parliamentarians or business people, Peace Corps program is a wonderful uh, example of a very good program that's, that's underway. At America, which Ted mentioned, a fabulous, fabulous uh, diplomatic vehicle, which you know faces funding threats, uh, to be perfectly honest, is, is, a, is something we absolutely have to keep going. So it's a long-term effort. I guess what I would say, uh, to summarize, I think we've made a really good start over the last three years, but there's a huge opportunity that's still awaiting us. And it's a lot of it is just, frankly, hard work. There's not a lot of easy magic bullets out there. It's just hard work every day, making sure that we're getting people together, getting the message out, working to solve the issues, and um, uh, trying to build public support in both countries for what I think is truly a, a hugely important relationship. So thank, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Everett, what's the view from the from the hill? Thanks, well, Everett. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the panel. I thought uh, I thought we heard some very very uh, interesting and important uh, guidance from uh, the the some of the people who lead this relationship and think about it uh, all the time. Uh, I heard some key messages uh, that. Is that a cue? <laughs> that was the key. That's the key. It's time to leave. Um, I heard listening uh, is important, engaging, strategic trust, relationships, um, devoting time equals returns, and hard work. And I think if we look at the, the U.S.-Indonesia relationships and partnerships that have really excelled, they all have all those ingredients in them. Um, and so we know that it's possible. I, I, I've been working on this uh, relationship for about 28 years now, and I have to say that um, we've always had the discussion, and I, I'm sure uh, David Merrill and, and Lynn and, and all of you guys have, have heard this, you know, we've been sitting around for years, uh, Barbara, you know, saying Americans don't know not enough about Indonesia. <laughs> you know, how many years, how many decades? Um, but I think more Americans do. What I, what I do think that uh, we, we are at a point where uh, Americans have to think about Indonesia, and I think that's probably a pretty good thing. A couple, a couple trends are happening that we track at CSIS. One, we're, we're entering a, a period where the, it's a more multipolar world, um, and, and power is more, a little more diffuse than it used to be. So we have to depend and build uh, relationships with, with key partners who are so like-minded, as Ted mentioned, and I think that's important. I would also say from the business point of view, um, American businesses are now looking for growth in Asia outside of China for a number of reasons that we can talk about if you want to. Uh, but they are all looking at Indonesia and they're looking at India. Um, they're looking at big economies where they could really do well. And they, they don't know Indonesia. I, I will say that um, I was at a dinner a couple of months ago with a, an, another ASEAN head of state and it was a great dinner. It was just 12 people or maybe 15 people around one table. And man, we really got into it. We just kicked off and it was back and forth, very comfortable. Um, but you know what we talked about for 50 minutes, the first 50 minutes, was China. When were you last there? And this was a dinner with uh, some US senators there, former USTRs, former national security advisors, former secretary of state, really high level Americans. And then the, the, uh, the to be unnamed um, head of state sort of looked at me and I swear he kind of winked. And he said, let's talk about Indonesia. And 
honestly, you could hear the crickets outside the Jefferson Hotel, you know. <laughs> um, and the, the Americans were like, wait, uh, you know, no one had been there uh, a week ago. Uh, people knew you. They knew, uh, they knew uh, Marty. Uh, they, they knew Rosa, for they sure. They knew the president, and, and they all knew Rosa, because that's, you know, she is the rock star in the room here. We all know that. But, um, you know, I think this is the thing. Henry Kissinger said, you know, when there's crises in Europe, I can close my eyes and see the face of the person that I need to, to, to talk to to resolve this crisis. I think a lot of uh, American leaders now can close their eyes, and they, they see uh, an incredible ambassador, they see a secretary of state, and they see the president, but not much deeper than that. And I think that's a challenge to both of us, not both sides. Uh, we need uh, a more vibrant exchange of our leaders, and they've got to talk to more people than just each other. Uh, and you've been good at that, Dino, but that's something that I think uh, is really important. Anyway, I wanted to um, open the floor to more interesting observations and questions than my own. This is, uh, I can look out in this audience and see all sorts of fantastic people and, and experts. So I want to open the floor. Please just identify yourself and your affiliation, and we'll get started. Uh, let me start at the front row. Margaret. I'd like to thank everybody. I'm Margaret Sullivan. Been, the first time I came into this embassy was 60 years ago. So I guess I count as one of the old hands. Um, yes. I heard some very interesting things, but there was something I didn't see. And I, while I heard it sort of bad about, I didn't hear. I think if we are building constituencies, we have to start young. Hmm. And I know that there is serious work that David Merrill and others are doing on university level education. I spent five years in Aceh, now and then, uh, working on a high school. And I think if we really want to build a long-term constituency, for Indonesia, we need to do what has been done for the Japanese and the Chinese, and we need to get into mutually developed history and geography that goes into our middle schools and our high schools in both countries. And we need to begin to make it important to learn Indonesian in high school. Now, that's a big deal. But I would suggest you start, when you put that nice little film on YouTube, by showing some of the reasons why Americans should know something about Indonesia and what the Indonesians are doing in this country. Because that looked very much like what Americans will do in Indonesia. Hmm. And the other thing I would do is see who can do it. But if you've got lots of Facebook, you get kids talking to kids on Facebook. And that's as good a way of getting a bilateral relationship that could grow. I mean, we have you, Latino, because you came to school in the United States as a kid. You have people like some people I am a parent of who are involved in this relationship because they were kids in Indonesia. But we've got to figure out how we bring that childhood thing into this relationship. I realize the importance of the high level things, but I think we also have to go low. But I think, ask the panel for any comments on that? No. I mean, I'll start. I, I guess what I would say is um, certainly agree uh, the three years that I was in Jakarta, uh, Ted and I, the top priority for our embassy was promoting educational exchange. Uh, getting more Indonesian students here to study, more American students there to study, um, other exchanges. Peace Corps is not quite an exchange program, but getting young Americans to Indonesia through things like the YES program, you know, where people, kids come in high school level and spend a year. Uh, mostly were Indonesians coming here, some increasing numbers of Americans going there. So it, it remains the embassy's top priority for exactly the reasons uh, that you mentioned, uh, as well as many other exchange programs. At America, 
is really, as Ted said, was really designed to reach out and get you reach out to young audiences. What we it's haven't. It's just in Jakarta. It's just in Jakarta. And we would be happy to build them in like 25 cities <laughs> around the world if we could get the funding for it. Um, but, you know, I mean, the, it's, it's tough budget wise. But what we haven't done well enough yet with Ad America, and, and I, it's it, for a variety of reasons, is use it to link young people there to young people here. We've done a great job of outreach there, less of a good job linking the people. Um, so I, I think we absolutely agree it goes to the whole point of it's building the, the grassroots support starting with, uh, starting with young people a lot through education. And thank you for the recommendations on the video. Uh, Heru? Good afternoon. Thank you, Sir. Uh, thank you for your uh, comments and, and uh, thoughts about increasing the better partnership between Indonesia and the uh, United States in the future. My name is Heru Pramayuda. I'm a student at uh, SAIS and South Beach University. Uh, in the past uh, three years before I came to SAIS, uh, I worked in the educational sector in Indonesia and focusedly uh, <coughs> specifically on, uh, on, on pursuing the goal within the comprehensive partnership that is to double the number of Americans in Indonesia and, and vice versa. But to be honest, the number would uh, uh, reflect kind of balance in the bilateral relations. If you look at the number of Indonesian students in the United States nowadays, uh, as Ambassador Dino mentioned, there's only around 70, 7,500 students in America, but the number of American students in Indonesia is much, much smaller. Three, five hundred students. Mm. So there's also a need to increase the interest, uh, to also reflect the rebalance towards Asia, not only from the U.S. State Department point of view, but also to export it, to transfer it to the educational uh, point of view. I kind of reflect on uh, the recent case of, of Chile and the response, and, and especially the people in the uh, academicians on the Middle East in the studies when the notions of rebalance or Asia, they are trying to re-engage the U.S. foreign policy to the region by, by publishing more papers. And we don't see a fight back from the scholars uh, you know, that are studying Southeast Asia and, and Indonesia and for that matter. So there's a, a need for, for Americans, in my point of view, uh, to, to know more about Indonesia. Since uh, Eric mentioned that it's been like three decades and it's still, uh, you know, listen to the crickets, uh, sort of the Jefferson politics. So, like, uh, I also reflect on from my point of view, I, I was a yes student back in 2004, and I came here uh, to, to pursue my higher education. But to be honest, if you see the, the global picture of the uh, of competition in higher education, the Fulbright you know, as like the, the front runner for the American public uh, policy education is losing out to everybody else. You see uh, the, the progressiveness, the outreach done by the Australian, the Korean, the Japanese, the European, two Indonesian students. The, the effort and outreach by the U.S. process is considered indubitable. So this is also the outlook that you need to be looking to export this interest, to share this common interest to the U.S. universities, uh, to attract more students from Indonesia, and add to the fact that you know, maybe uh, there's a decreasing number of funding from the U.S. Third Department to fund these programs. It can also uh, uh, involve the private sector. But one thing uh, to be noted, uh, one important thing is the Indonesian government has more and more scholarship now to uh, support the studies of Indonesia abroad. So if the U.S. is really uh, interested to have more Indonesians uh, in this country, there's a lot more ways uh, to pursue this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David? Uh, could we have some, uh, I just want to ask, uh, here, right over here. Uh, I appreciate if you have some questions for the panel, and we could probably link together Absolutely. quite a few statements here. Uh, I think it's uh, very <laughs> appropriate to mention, as the report does, uh, that the third pillar of the comprehensive partnership, the people to people, is the relatively most underutilized one. Uh, uh, we can take that further, I think, as the two presidents did in the joint declaration that actually this is at the core, as I said, of the comprehensive partnership. And it's also the pillar that is the most essential for what Ambassador Dino was talking about for the vitality and sustainability of the comprehensive partnership beyond the terms of the two incumbent presidents. Particularly since it's increasingly recognized that the two governments, if they ever did, no longer have the funds 
to do what needs to be done. Uh, they, the two governments can do, I would estimate, at best, less than 50% of what needs to be done. So we need to look specifically, I believe, at what can be done by non-government groups and public-private partnerships to actually implement new dimensions of the partnership between now and 2020 uh, in cooperation with government. Uh, a couple of ideas are great. One is, and Dino has heard this before, I think Scott as well, greater attention to the structure of the government NGO relationship and private sector relationship. As we know, the structure that was devised at the beginning was uh, a series of working groups that entirely <coughs> consists of government officials. Although there have been a few uh, interactions with non-government officials, uh, that, have, that trend needs to increase, that needs to increase. There has been progress on this front. Last uh, June in Jakarta, we organized together with the working group of the uh, Comprehensive Partnership on Climate Change, the first uh, interaction between the working group and the NGO private sector, Ambassador Marcial, attended. Uh, we need to do more of those. Uh, that shouldn't be uh, such a hard feat to accomplish. And I hope it can be regularized. Uh, the governments, I think, need to take the lead on that, uh, although with the encouragement of the NGOs. David, did you have a question for the panel? Because I, I think we should probably get to some questions. Well, we don't uh, have a lot of time. Those are a couple comments. I have more. I thought the comments were also uh, solid. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Amitabh, see your hand first. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate uh, the CSI report because as a professor who teaches uh, Southeast Asia and Northern Powers, a few weeks ago I was looking for many many resources. And there wasn't really that much written on Indonesia, or especially even Indonesia relations. I found a report on uh, EU Indonesia relations, which I assigned to my students, even though I have been Indonesian students in the past. So now I'm very happy to actually have something that students can actually use. And that's really the key because what we have in the US Indonesia relations is a, uh, like a, it's a, it's a knowledge gap, uh, a familiarity gap. Uh, I think all Indonesians know about the United States, that Americans know about Indonesia. And suddenly, at the level of uh, graduate or graduate students. And, uh, and that leads me to a, a, a suggestion and a question. Uh, in one of the suggestions or uh, recommendations, uh, you say, the report says that, I haven't read the report, uh, so I will look, look for reading that. But I saw that uh, uh, U.S. should encourage Indonesia to live up to the commitments of, uh, that it has taken under G20. So G20 was mentioned. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly how it was framed. But this is really one of the keys. The, the countries that get most recognition in the world today are the so-called emerging powers, or rising powers. I just came back from a Rio a conference on the BRICS. And I uh, find Indonesia is not a break, uh, BRICS. But it can easily be a break. We just need to put one eye in the pronunciation. Um, but I'm wondering if the United States would encourage Indonesia not just to accept or uh, follow up the commitments <coughs> of the G20, but also to actually play a more active role uh, in G20 and exercise the kind of leadership which uh, only Indonesia can exercise. Uh, and just to uh, conclude by giving one example, the, if we regard Indonesia as an emerging power, uh, if not a rising power, at least an emerging power. Indonesia's emergence is very different from the emergence of any other country, mm. at least in Asia. Most of the emerging powers of Asia, like China, India, South Korea, Japan, they were first very significant military and economic players, or both. Uh, and then they have influence. In the case of Indonesia, it's still not a very significant military uh, country, or even an economic player yet, but it still has more influence, especially the kind of examples you get, mediating in Thai, Cambodia border in Burma, no, no Asian country can do that because of the historical bias. India cannot do that, China cannot do that. The moment they do it, they will be, people will think, oh, they have a national interest. Right. Only Indonesia can do that. So the rise of Indonesia is very different, is uh, in, in a very different way than the other uh, you know, Asian rising powers. So let and me. Most of them don't know about so the. Uh, India, I guess the question to the panel is. If I heard this right, can can or should the United States encourage Indonesia to use this power? And and Dina, w would that be effective? And, and Scott, you want to share your wisdom? Uh, I 
Yeah. I mean, thanks. It's a good question. I mean, I, I guess what I would say is if you went and talked to Dino's colleagues at Kemlo in Jakarta, they would complain that we're giving them far too many suggestions on things <laughs> that they could usefully do around the world. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, I, I think the truth is we, you know, part of the comprehensive partnership, and, and this is the trouble with things like comprehensive partnerships, people are looking for numbers. And some of what we do is much more subtle than that. The fact is we're talking and engaging, whether it's Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Nadal Agawa tomorrow. My guess is, you know, what are they going to talk about? They're going to talk about Syria, Iran, they're going to talk about East Asia Summit, they're going to talk about South China Sea, I'm guessing, right? Um, so this is happening all the time now, and we have had, uh, you know, when I was in Jakarta, we had extensive discussions with the government on, on a whole host of regional issues. How could we work together to support reform in Myanmar? How do we deal with, you know, problems like Syria, North Korea? So this is going on, and we certainly do, um, as I said, probably offer the Kemlu more, more suggestions on things they could do than they would prefer. But, did you want to comment on that? No, I think, G20 is also new to us, uh, Amitav, uh, and I think I'm, our ambition, I hope I'm not wrong in saying this, is really not to lead it, right? Uh, we've been very clear that uh, uh, what we want is for the G20 to be the premier international, uh, premier forum for international eco economic cooperation that has been achieved. Uh, we want to make sure that the decisions reached in the G20 uh, reflect uh, the new international economic landscape and also uh, reflect the interests of the developing countries. Uh, Indonesia has said that we're there representing the, uh, the, the aspirations or the needs of the interests of developing countries, but also uh, of, of, of ASEAN. Yeah? Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, the G20 remains relevant, uh, despite the fact that the crisis uh, is no longer there, the 2008 crisis, uh, and that uh, it will uh, you know, it, it, it will it will continue uh, to to address uh, uh, pertinent uh, international e economic issues. So, so our interests, uh, our ambition, to be honest, uh, is is not to to lead up front, but to be part of the pack in in helping to the de uh, determining issues that will shape the world economy. Yeah. Uh, Rich. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Richard Cronin with the uh, Stipton Center here in D.C. Um, I'd like to go back to the uh, trade and economic issues and, uh, and ask a very simple question, and that is, uh, we have Austin 2015 coming up, and uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of elements of that are, are in the integration area, but uh, I wondered if the panelists have any comment on whether uh, Austin uh, 2015, as we know it now, is going to help much at all with the issues that have been uh, that the ever times have been talking about. Thank you. So you want? Uh, Barbara, I saw your hand. Uh, Barbara Harvey, retired foreign service officer, and a quick question for Scott. Uh, one of the reasons, as I understand it, that there was a decline in Indonesian students coming to the U.S was immediately after 9-11, the U.S. tightened up a lot on visa uh, requirements and restrictions. Is, has that been changed? What is the policy now on visas? Thank you. Uh, it's fixed. It's fixed. We're giving them away. Ted and I stand out in the street corner <laughs> handing them away so they go by. Um, it, I, I think it, the problem, to the extent it existed, the problem has been fixed. Um, we're, when I left, we were approving 96% of student visa applications, which is high by any standards. Um, but the perception problem hasn't been completely fixed. So that's something that we, we've done a lot of work on it. Um, I mean, literally, every, every person I talked to in Indonesia for three years, I said, by the way, did you know that we're giving away student visas? Um, but we still have more work to do to, to, because that perception is changing, but still part of the problem. Okay, uh, there's a lot of questions left and only a little time. I saw Aaron and then we'll, we'll do one in the back there. Thank you. Uh, Aaron Conley from All Rights Number Group. Uh, you know, I was very uh, struck by what you said about the sensitivity uh, of the statutory reports the U.S. government has been recent. I think frankly all of us who have worked with the executive have had more flexibility in the way that it addressed these issues. But as long as we're uh, talking pretty strong, I wanted to ask you, um, 
you know, it seems to me that one of the reasons that it is so important for the U.S. to produce these reports is because many of the things in these reports are true. It does appear that the administration could have been doing more over the past three years uh, to address religious violence, uh, take a more compassionate position on trafficking of persons. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons that opponents of the administration in Indonesia use these comments uh, against the administration is because they're true. The U.S. has the credibility in making statements. Uh, and, but my question to you is, because we want this closer partnership, what is the more constructive way that we could be going about addressing these issues? Does it have to be behind closed doors in Kenya? Are there other ways that the U.S. government or the U.S. society in general uh, could be making these, uh, making a statement on these issues or trying to address them in cooperation with the Indonesian government? Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, look. Uh, I don't doubt that uh, the contents of the report is uh, important. Uh, and um, uh, perhaps uh, many of the points raised uh, are, are true. I, mean, I, I don't have uh, uh, beef with that. Uh, but what I am saying is this. Uh, when the reports are issued, and we're not talking about one report, we're talking about many reports throughout the year, it puts us in a defensive situation. Right, and when the report is coming out, the the discussions internally with Jakarta is okay. Do we fight back and we fight back hard, right? And then others say no, don't just ignore it and so on and so on. But it disrupts the energy, the dynamism, and the momentum, you know. Uh, and we say yeah, oh well, that's right. That point is right. That point is right. Yeah. But then we get into a defensive mode, right? Uh, if you ask me how do we overcome, I don't know, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, we need to think about it, uh, but uh, definitely it's something that the U.S. side needs to know and uh, needs to know that, uh, you know, it does uh, put the relationship in an uneasy uh, uh, atmosphere. And if you ask me do we prefer the reports to be uh, conveyed confidentially and in closed door, if you ask me, I think it would be more effective. It would be, we would be more receptive to the message if it was given to us in a confidential and closed way, because that way we don't respond defensively, right? But when we receive the report and it's public and it, it shoot all over the world, then that's when, as I said, uh, we get into a defensive mode and then the tempo of the relationship is, is disrupted uh, that way. So. Okay, I, I think we said we'd take one last question. Uh, uh, Kumar, I think it was in the back there. I think uh, the previous question, but I have a quick uh, follow up. Uh, both countries, uh, US and Indonesia, gave uh, priority to human rights. Both are members of the UN Human Rights Council. But uh, I did not see any discussion about human rights except for the question and answer. One, obviously, the visa should be saved by targeting because of ethnic or religious reasons. Having said that, uh, there were 50 recommendations. Is there any recommendations among the 50 that have the one human rights? That's my question. Thanks. Um, Ted and Murray, you want to? Sure. Not a specific one on human rights, uh, but there are many that are. Oops, sorry. There, there, are, there are many that are related to how we deal with one another, and I think we wrote it in this. I think acknowledging some of what uh, Pacino has said that sometimes we've we've found that we've been able to deal with these issues better if we were on the same side, if we work together to address these issues as a common problem rather than. Uh, confronting each other and saying, this is your problem, now fix it. So we, we try to address it as looking at these issues as a, as a common challenge. Uh, I just add uh, two sentences. Yes, please. We have uh, one of the six working groups under the Comprehensive Partnership is Democracy Working Group, or fundamentally we talk about how we can work together on democracy and human rights issues, not only bilaterally, but more around the world. Well, I'd like to uh, thank the panel and thank all of you. I, I'm tremendously optimistic about this relationship. 
Uh, I, I do believe we're headed in the right direction thanks to the work that you've done. I'd like to thank the authors of the report, um, Ted, Murray, uh, Greg Poling. Uh, There's a lot of effort put into this uh, from our team. Thank you all for coming and thank you for the warm hospitality, Dino. Good night.